Okay, good. All right. Well, I have the privilege of not preaching today again. I always love that. <laughs> no, but what I love the most about it is uh, that we get to hear from, from different people and about what God is putting on their heart. And as you have seen today on the props already, I know just the guy who likes props just as much as I do. <laughs> I actually asked Pastor Tim, come on up um, to, to speak today to us. Uh, the series is over, and as we're resetting, and now Christmas comes, and um, just going to be like um, leading up toward Christmas. But Pastor Tim is so faithfully upstairs teaching our children. You ever notice that? I don't know if you notice when, when he walks in the hallway how the kids react to him. They all know him, they respect him, that they look up to him because he's pouring into their lives on an ongoing basis and he's got something to say. And I just wanted to invite him to share so that you also see what's on this guy's heart. I love it. I think when I picked him, I picked the cherry off the cake. He is, he is a great guy. Here, let me just pray for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for Pastor Tim. I thank you, Father, for everything that he's doing upstairs so faithfully for both him and Camellia, how to work together. Father, I just ask a blessing over their life. And as he's sharing the word right now, Father, just burn it in his heart. Just uh, have a fresh anointing over my brother, Father, and just let him speak it with authority, Father. And just kindle in our hearts a new belief and a new trust in you to trust you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead. Oh, I knew we forgot something. Good morning. Well, so when Pastor Arnold asked me a couple weeks ago to uh, start preparing a message for this Sunday, I started thinking, okay, so what do I want to speak on? What do I, you know, there's a list of things that I love to talk about, you know. But I really felt led to give you guys what I would call a snapshot of what we teach the kids upstairs. Um, we don't just teach them, oh, here's a Bible story, here's a coloring sheet, have a great week. Um, upstairs, we're actually really digging in the Word, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to the kids, and I'm seeing life-changing things happen in these kids. I get text messages from parents every week saying, hey, my kid's doing this now. It's amazing to see you. Thank you. And it's not me. It's him. And so I wanted to give you this snapshot. And I specifically wanted to talk about three things that we've talked about in the last couple weeks up in the kids' church. Just things that have been burning on my heart and just made a lot of difference to my family as well. Um, each week upstairs, we start off our lessons with what we call a ponder point. And a ponder point is a statement that is attributes of God. And so today's ponder point, if you will, our main point for today is that God is. God is many things, right? But today we're going to focus on three things that God is, especially in the book of Exodus, the story of the Israelites, Moses, and in Egypt, and how God brought them out. Our goal in River Kids is to allow your child to see how the Bible is relevant to them today, and how we can use the stories from the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, to actually speak to their lives. And how that the Old Testament stories aren't just individual stories, it's all one big God story showing the kids that God is their Redeemer. And so the story of Moses might be looking at it and you go, oh, Moses is the hero in the Bible, but really it's still Jesus is the hero in the Bible because God is. Amen? So our story starts off in the first book of Exodus, Right? This is right after Joseph and his coat of many colors and how he was in Egypt and a lot of Israelites, Hebrew people, started coming to Egypt to seek shelter from the famine. And it started growing in numbers and it actually got Pharaoh nervous because he was afraid that they were going to mount up against him if there was an enemy attacking and join the enemy and defeat Egypt. And so he enslaved them put them to hard labor and beat them because he was afraid of what would happen. He went as far as to make a law that if any Hebrew baby was born that was a boy, 
they were to take it and chuck it into the Nile River and kill it because that way they couldn't mass populate the earth. You see, what's really great about that story, though, is there was one baby boy that was born to this mom, and the mom saw that the child was well, and the mom decided to keep it safe and hidden for three months. And when she couldn't hide it any longer, she put the baby in a basket among the reeds in the Nile River. And that's when Pharaoh's daughter found the baby, picked him up, and named him Moses, which meant withdrew out of the water. That's just the beginning of where God is. You see, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 through 12, it says, One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and he hid them or hid him in the sand. The next two days, or sorry, the, ne- the next day, Moses saw two Israelites fighting. He asked them why they were hitting their fellow man. The man asked him if he was going to plan to kill them like he killed the Egyptian. Moses was terrified. You see, Pharaoh heard about this and put a bounty on Moses' head. He wanted Moses killed. So Moses, out of the fear for his life, he ran away. Later on in chapter 3, in the book of Exodus, we hear about Moses out tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. He discovered a strange sight. Something that just caught his eye. What he saw was a bush that was on fire but was not being consumed. A bush that was on fire but was not being consumed. It was an awe, a wonder, something that definitely would get your attention. And he decided to go see what it was. He came forward and got closer. And when he got closer, he heard, Moses, Moses. Moses replied, here I am. And God told him not to come any closer and to take his shoes off, his sandals off, because he was on holy ground. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 6 through 15, it, says the, it talks about the encounter at the burning bush. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hiviites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? But Moses said to God, er, And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, 
I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. God is I am. That is the name that God wanted to be called and worshipped by. It's the name that expresses his character as the dependable, faithful God who desires his full trust of his people. Moses talked with God for a little bit, but he was terrified. Terrified and said, who am I to do that? He made every excuse in the book. But God made a way out for him to take those fears away. You see, he told him to throw his staff on the ground, and when he threw it on the the ground, it became a snake. He obviously ran away for a little bit and came back. He picked it up, and it turned back into the staff. Then a little bit later, God says, put your arm in your cloak. Now take it out. And his arm was filled with leprosy. And he says, now put it back and take it out. And it was clean. These were things that God was showing his power to Moses at that moment in time. But then he also made the excuse, well, I don't speak well. I'm not good with words. And God took that excuse right away and said, fine, your brother Aaron will speak for you. Now you have no excuse. Go. After Moses talked with the elders and told them the I am sent him, his brother Aaron and himself went to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go so they can worship him. Every time Pharaoh said no, God used his mighty power to send plagues against Egypt. God was being the Israelites' warrior. You see, God is warrior. God fights the battles. A warrior, by definition, is an experienced fighter or soldier who never gives up until they are victorious. At that moment in time, God was showing the Israelites that he is warrior. It started off with as simple as going, okay, throw your staff on the ground, it becomes a snake. Pharaoh thinks he's so cool that he decides to get people that use demonic powers that are magicians to show that he can do it too. God still shows his power by having the snake eat the other snakes. But Pharaoh still said no. So he sent more and more plagues and things to go against them. He turned the Nile River to blood and the fish died. Frogs showed up everywhere, including their bread dough. Gnats covered Egypt. Flies came in abundance. We already get annoyed with flies as it is. Imagine like 50 million of them around you. The Egyptians' livestock got sick and died. The Egyptians got boils on their skin. Hail came down from the sky. Locusts came into Egypt in abundance. Darkness so thick you could feel it. And when Pharaoh still wouldn't let God's people go, God sent the worst and saddest plague yet. God came and killed every firstborn son of anybody in Egypt that didn't have lamb's blood painted on their doorposts. And the only ones that had that were the Israelites. Throughout all these plagues, God protected the Israelites from each and every one of them. The Israelites didn't feel the darkness. The Israelites didn't get bothered by the frogs or the gnats or the flies or the locusts or any of that. It didn't bother them at all because God was being their warrior at that moment in time and fighting their battle for them. Pharaoh finally told the Israelites to leave. And so they quickly gathered their stuff and headed out. God was their warrior, fighting their battle for them. You see, Exodus chapter 14, verse 14 says this. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. We have to boldly trust God for him to fight our battles. The position we need to take is on our knees still at the feet of Jesus. 
This is the position we need to take. After the Israelites left Egypt, they came to where there was a mountain on one side of them and a mountain on the other side. And straight ahead of them was the Red Sea. And coming up fast behind them was Pharaoh and his army. You see, Pharaoh changed his mind again, and so they were coming after the Israelites in full force. There was no way for them to get out of that situation without a miracle happening. No way. Turn back, you get slaughtered or taken captive again by Pharaoh and his army. You turn left or right, you go into the mountains, you could die. You go straight forward, you're going to drown. There had to be a miracle that happened right then and there. God told Moses to stretch his arms over the Red Sea, and all that night a strong wind came and separated the Red Sea, allowing the Israelites to walk across on dry land. The Bible says that there was like a wall of water to their left and a wall of water to their right. The kid part inside me would love to be there and just put my hand in the water and go, Wee! Or go, look, Mom, I got a fish! God did something miraculous there to save them. Once the Israelites got across, God had Moses raise his arms over the sea again, and the waves came crashing down over Pharaoh's army. God was victorious. God is victorious in our lives as well. Sometimes in our lives, God, through the Holy Spirit's leading, is telling us to do something or calling us to trust him fully. We need to stop and remember that God is I am, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Some of us, we struggle trusting God because of the trials in our lives. Maybe we look at the checkbook and go, oh no, that's not going to work out, God. Or maybe there's just another thing up ahead and you just are looking at it with turmoil going, God, I can't trust you with this. It's not working out in my way. We need to stop at that point and remember that God is warrior. He fights for his people and we are his people. Amen? And finally, when we continue to trust God, we will see that God is victorious. We'll see that in our lives. I'm going to ask my wife, Camelia, to come up here because, you see, this whole story of the Egyptians and that God is I am and God is warrior and God is victorious plays a part of our story. You see, I wanted to talk to you guys about this. You see, we have two daughters, Bristol Paige Dazelski and Chloe Grace Dazelski. Now, I'm not putting these pictures up to show, hey, look at my family. They're so adorable. Aww. I mean, they are adorable, but that's not why I'm putting them up there. I'm putting them up there because there's this whole story of the Exodus reminds me of how God was I am, God was our warrior, and God was victorious in our lives. When Bristol, our oldest, when Bristol, our oldest, was born in August 23rd, 2016, my wife started slipping into a postpartum depression. When Bristol was about five weeks old, Camelia had a suicide note written out. She didn't see any hope in living. She didn't see the purpose. She was having a hard time seeing the positives in her life, especially in her five-week-old. As a husband and a father... I immediately had to get on my knees and pray and seek God. It was a hard time in our lives. We went through several months of seeking help for her 
to get in a better place. We fast forward another year, and we just felt that God was leading us out of the church that we were currently at. This was a huge step of faith. We didn't know where we were going to go. The fear of the unknown is one of the biggest fears, and that's what we were experiencing at that time. We had interviewed with several churches to find out where God wanted us. But none of them felt right. None of them felt like what God wanted to have us. But that is when God reminded me and us of Exodus 14, 14. Be still and know that I'm God. I will fight for you. I knew it was time for us as a family to take a break from being on staff at a church. Especially for Camelia to be able to find the healing that she needs. We were struggling with our finances because working at a daycare, you don't make much. We continue to trust God, however. Fall or summer of 2018, Camelia lost her job. The apartment complex we were living at, she was working as the uh, leasing consultant. And when they sold the property to a different company, she lost her job. Another wave in our ride. We had to trust God because not only was she getting paid, but she was getting a discount, and we had to trust God completely. But because of that time of her losing her job, it messed up the new company's bookkeeping completely. In December of 2018, we welcomed little Chloe Grace to our family. She's about to turn one in like 16 days. We enjoyed having her with us during the Christmas season. But now we go to January of 2019, just a short 11 months ago. This is when, excuse the term, but crap hit the fan. The apartment complex books, they finally got them straightened out to know what the discount was showing up and wasn't supposed to. And they found out that we owed $2,800 before the end of January or else we were going to be evicted. The same weekend that we were dealing with that, Chloe, at 20 days old, spiked a fever of 102 degrees. Head into the ER, lots of tests, but out of fear of meningitis, they sent Chloe via ambulance from Litchfield, because we were visiting my family, all the way to St. Paul to Children's. Four spinal taps later, they found out it was just a urinary tract infection. My dad still today believes that there was probably something worse that Chloe was probably going through, but God made it better. I wish, I really wish, this was the end of our January. <laughs> you see, on January 30th, I got a text message from my mom and my sister <laughs> notifying me that my five-month-old nephew, Merrick, had passed away from SIDS. <laughs> I was like, God, Why? We took every amount of trust in God to keep praying and keep seeking out what God wanted for us. Around the same time in January is when I sent my resume to a couple other churches. Finally, after a year of not sending them out, trusting God, saying, you know, if this is what you want, God, if you feel like this is the time, I'm putting out a feeler saying, God, I trust you. We were able to get the rent paid from January, but to stop the headache that we had with the apartment complex, we also put our two-month notice in, saying we were going to move out. We knew as a family that was going to be a huge step of faith because we did not know where we were going to move to. We did not know where God was going to do. The end of March is when we were supposed to move out of the apartment complex. 
And in the middle of March, three weeks before the end, we decided to make the biggest step of faith we possibly could. Camille and I were working at a daycare, and we put our two weeks' notice in. No job prospect, really. No place to live coming up here at the end of the month. Big, huge step of faith. The entire last week of March, we packed up all of our belongings, put some into storage, and moved into my parents' basement. We were jobless. We were homeless. We did not know what God wanted to do. A couple weeks after this huge step of faith, I got a phone call from one of the pastors I sent my resume to. He asked if I would come work for him as the children's pastor. I said yes, and we are glad to be here at Riverside serving under Pastor Arnold. I tell you this story because this is how God showed us as a family that he is I am, that he is our warrior, and he is victorious. Camelia is doing tons better than when we had the suicide note. She's doing tons better. We have a job that I am passionate about and love working at. And we have an amazing, amazing church family that we feel loved by. God is amazing. Thank you. This lesson, you can go sit down. This lesson was one that we taught the kids several weeks ago over a three week period. And when we talked about God as warrior, we told the kids about first Peter chapter five, verse seven. Which says, cast all your worries and your cares to God, for he cares for you. And at the end of the lesson, I put this brick in front of the kids. And I said, this is where you leave your burdens, your anxieties, your cares, all that. You write it on that brick and you give it to God. And they wrote all over this brick, even in the inside of it. Some of you in this room today, you need to cast your anxieties, your cares, your worries, and your burdens onto him. You need to see him fighting in your life. You need to see God as I am. You need and desire for God to be victorious in your life. The worship team is going to sing the song, Break Every Chain. And as they sing that song, I have 16 bricks laid across the front. And Pastor Jim, can you grab the markers, please? And there's going to be markers all across here. And I want you to do what your kids did and write your anxieties and your burdens on these bricks for God to take. Maybe your anxieties are finances. Maybe your anxieties are your bickering and fighting with your spouse. Maybe it could be completely different than that. I don't care what it is. Come lay it on this altar at Jesus' feet and let him carry it for you. You don't have to carry it anymore. If I would have carried our burden as a family, I wouldn't be here right now. I laid it at God's feet and I let him take care of it. So as they play this song, come forward, write your anxieties on these blocks.